We want to remind the public that it will take a few days to fully return to normal. We urge people in affected regions to only buy the gas they need uh, so that we can help speed up the process. The gas price has not been this high nationally since the last time Joe Biden was in the White House. We do not believe the Russian government was involved in this attack. But we do have strong reason to believe that the criminals who did the attack are living in Russia. The Russians yeah. need to fix this problem if, in fact, it emanated from there. It's ridiculous to think that we should just let this go away. Let's bring in our panel, Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. We're going to take us former State Department spokesperson, Matthew Cottenetti, founding editor of The Washington Free Beacon. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Morgan, I'll start with you. Uh, how do we deal with Russia if this is being sold, not as an official state-sanctioned act, but something that emanated from within Russia's borders? Well, I think any of us who've worked in national security find it hard to believe that the uh, that these cyber criminals and hackers, I like to call them cyber terrorists actually, uh, are living and working in Russia and that the government isn't at least aware of these attacks. Uh, so obviously I'm not privy to what the government's doing behind the scenes, but I think at a minimum we could start demanding uh, that these hackers uh, be extradited to the United States. We need to start putting in a level of deterrence. Uh, Lindsey Graham talked this week with Brian Kilmeade about how he wants to put forth legislation uh, that these uh, cyber hackers be treated as terrorists. And really, I think if you look at what happened this week, we saw just how vulnerable our critical infrastructure is. And you really have to ask yourself, what's the difference between a suicide bomber, you know, blowing up one of these type, uh, pipelines or the cyber hacker that takes the pipeline off for several weeks of production? Uh, so I think it may be time to rethink how we treat these people, to put in a level of deterrence so that the Russian government or any government it feels the pain for the hackers on their soil. Charles, these concerns have been raised before, but until it really happens, I think, to a lot of people, and there have been millions who have been scouring for gas stations, uh, waiting in lines, paying elevated prices, uh, it brings it back to the forefront. What can the Biden administration do uh, to, in some way, learn lessons or institute new principles or policies with respect to the cyber hacking threats? It reminds you a little bit, even though the cause was different, of how all of a sudden the electrical grid went out in Texas uh, this winter. We're discovering new vulnerabilities to our energy infrastructure all the time. Uh, I think it's problematic to cooperate on a security matter with Vladimir Putin's Russia. No question about it, that would be the ideal solution if you could somehow induce them to turn over these bad guys, but you can never be sure that that government is gonna play straight with us. So I expect actually the Biden administration to emphasize that this is part of why we need an infrastructure bill, or maybe you need to readjust mm -hmm. the infrastructure program that he's already suggesting to devote more federal resources to hardening our systems so that they're not vulnerable to criminals in the first place. Well, Matthew, one of the accounts I read of the infrastructure proposal said that it actually didn't contain things that would have helped in an attack like this. Um, is there an opportunity there for the Biden administration to still sell the infrastructure, maybe make some changes to it, uh, that package with this in mind? I guess so. I mean, Shannon, for me, this week has just been a reminder of how uh, driven by events this administration is. You know, the Biden team really thinks that they can control the message. But we've just been reminded again and again in the past week about how uh, mugged by reality they are by the events. I think something happened when Biden visited <laughs> former President Carter a few weeks ago, because it's we've like deja vu of the 1970s and a preview, I think, of what might happen uh, if some of these Biden policies uh, continue. I want to play a little bit of the back and forth that got us to where we are now, the latest with the CDC mask recommendations, and then we'll get some reaction. What we've done is we've empowered the American people to make their own decisions about their own health. This probably could have been done about a month ago. I assume the inflection point hit. They probably got some political direction and they made the change. The CDC, the doctors and medical experts there, were the ones who determined what this guidance would be based on their own data and what the timeline would be. That was not a decision directed by, made by the White House. It was informed, the White House was informed of that decision. All right, want to work around and get a quick comment from each of you on the mask timing uh, so we can get through to winners and losers as well. Matthew, we'll start with you on this one. 
Well, I'm too happy about the news to really be concerned about the politicization. But I do think that if there were po politics involved, it might not have come from the White House, but the CDC itself, because it's been looking at this drop-off in vaccination rates, and maybe it finally realized that its messaging was completely wrong. You needed to incentivize the vaccines, not feel like you're punishing people by forcing them to wear masks. I mean, Charles, with that and the announcement about getting back to schools full bore in the fall, it seemed like a lot lifted at once. Yes, Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, has been dragging her feet about allowing people back in school. All of a sudden, holds a press conference, and now she's all in on it. So, look, would it be a surprise that politics influenced this? Of course not. Politics influences everything. But I do think there is a valid underlying reality here, which is the vaccine. It is taking hold. Resistance is going away a little bit, and this reflects that. Okay, Morgan, final comment from you on the masks, and then kick us off with your winner and loser. Well, Shannon, I've spent a lot of money invested in cute masks, including some very cute Lily Pulitzer masks <laughs> that I don't know what to do with anymore. So, you know, I guess I'll just donate them to charity. Okay, <laughs> my winner of the week uh, is my very, very dear friend, Elise Stefanik. Um, I am so happy for her to be number three uh, in the House Republicans today. Uh, beyond being um, a millennial, awesome woman congressman, uh, she actually has done a lot to recruit uh, women around the country to run as Republicans, and I believe we had more Republicans than ever, so uh, thank you, Elise, for doing that, and congrats, my friend. I am so proud of you. And your loser. Uh, my loser is Rob Malley, Biden's Iran envoy. Uh, this week, it was uncovered that about 12 years ago, he had an interview uh, where he said that Hamas was merely misunderstood. So it's a bad week for that to be uncovered, a bad week to be negotiating uh, with Iran whenever Hamas is supplying, is shooting these rockets uh, into Israel. All right, gentlemen, so we don't get cut off. Charles, to you quickly on winner and loser, then Matthew. My winners, my co-winners are Benny Thompson and John Katko, uh, leaders, Democratic and Republican of the Homeland Security Committee, who have put together a proposal that might fly for a January 6th commission. My loser is uh, Congresswoman Green from Georgia, who managed to exceed her previous record for unprofessional conduct up on the Hill by sort of chasing down uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the halls of Congress and has also been caught on video a couple of years ago behaving weirdly outside her office, too. Matthew, finish my, this up. My winner is Elon Musk for his star turn hosting SNL, and my loser is Rebecca <laughs> Jones. The mainstream media purported uh, that she was a whistleblower accusing Ron DeSantis of fudging COVID data. A blockbuster report in National Review this week shows that she was a fraud. And it, just as a reminder, Shannon, if you come at Ron DeSantis, you better not miss. <laughs> and there are plenty who are and are looking at him as a 2024 target as well. Uh, Matthew Charles and Morgan, thank you all. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.